Uh, welcome everyone to today's session of Galactic Fidelity webinar series. Um, today uh, we are hosting uh, Dr. Salim Peru, um, who is an ELT higher risk project scientist at ESO in Kaohsiung, Germany. Uh, today, uh, Salim would talk about the cosmic baryon and metal cycles. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, thank you very much for an invitation to talk about some of this work um, that has been published in the annual review uh, last year in collaboration with Chris Hawk. Um, I'd like to start maybe by reviewing what are the different constituents of the universe. Um, many of us try to understand the dark energy and dark matter component in particular, but I'd like to highlight that um, even the remaining so-called normal matter is still poorly understood. In fact, um, only 10% of the baryons of the normal matter are in stars, and the remaining 90% are part of this so-called intergalactic gas, which is the focus of, of today's uh, presentation. So I'm going to now show a simulation movie from Illustrious TNG50 that illustrates how gas from the cosmic web uh, falls into galaxies, cools down uh, through Lyman alpha radiation to make atomic gas and then molecular gas that is the fuel for star formation. Later, supernovae and AGN uh, drive galactic winds that in turn will expel some of these material metals and, and mass and energy into the surrounding medium. And this is encoded by the metallicity that is shown here in the uh, blue maps. Um, and also it's due to this gas moving in and out uh, with radial velocity of 100 kilometers per second uh, or so. The light in this object as shown here in um, H alpha is only capturing a very infim uh, minute um, of these processes. And most of these gas processes are not seen in the starlight. These physical processes of inflow and outflows take place in the halo of galaxies that we sometimes refer to as the circumgalactic medium. Now, if we look uh, in simulations again, and also in some of our observable about how the gas is distributed around galaxy, the picture we have is uh, the most central part of galaxy has high density of gas that is mostly neutral. And as we move out from galaxies, the gas become more ionized and the cross section of that gas on the sky is larger. So if we look at the column density distribution, which is the number of objects of a given column density, where the column density is a measure of uh, the number of atoms over a surface area, so it's the number of atoms per square centimeters, then we have um, a, a picture of how many objects there is of a given uh, column density. So, um, by looking at this quantity in both uh, alls, which is a set of SPH simulation uh, that are, came before Eagle and uh, Illustrious TNG, um, one can look at how the column density of uh, gas relates to the vo volume uh, density. So the higher the column density, the higher the volumic density. So the number of atoms per uh, cubic centimeter. The higher the column density, the denser the gas. So the gas is essentially self-shielded from a UV background and uh, only uh, you know, the central part is neutral. And as we move out of galaxy, the upper part of the gas is uh, more and more ionized. And in fact, we can look at the distribution of the gas uh, about the galaxy, the radial profile of both molecular gas and atomic gas. And we see that the molecular gas is mostly central to galaxies, while the H1 atomic gas uh, extends far further um, at larger uh, right eye. So I see that you are still on the movie slide. Is this correct? Yes. 
a hard time changing slides somehow. Maybe uh, we could start from the beginning and resume. That that might improve it. All right. Let me try a little further. So essentially. Essentially, how do we measure this, this gas? We use um, uh, unrelated background sources. So it could be bright quasars, or it could be uh, GRBs, gamma ray bursts, or it could be uh, fast radio bursts. And these um, background sources uh, emit photons that travel along the line of sight to the observer through these gas clouds and the CGM of the second galactic medium of various galaxies. And by looking at the spectrum of these background sources, we um, see in absorption the property of the gas. So that could be the density, the temperature, the metallicity. And this um, gave us information um, that is insensitive to, I mean, it's independent of the emission properties. So we can reach very low density gas. Um, on the other hand, these properties, these techniques um, only depends on the brightness of a, a background source. So potentially we can go up to the highest redshift with the same sensitivity. So this is really stuck for some reason. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Yes, that, that might work. It's a bit quicker on what we were talking about. So um, I wanted to, to pose a few questions in this talk, um, starting about uh, how the gas reservoir, uh, which uh, fuels star formation evolves. So I'm sure you're very familiar with this plot from um, Maddow and Dickinson's review in 2014 which shows the rate of star formation uh, per unit of uh, cosmological volume um, that increase from uh, high redshift to um, a redshift about two, which is uh, what we call the epoch of galaxy assembly, stays high up to redshift one. And then there is a dramatic decrease by uh, several order of magnitudes until today. Obviously the naive view that we have is that this, um, star formation rate should increase you know, uh, from high redshift to lower redshift just by um, as stars are being formed with cosmic times. The decrease from redshift two to today is, is, uh, is not expected per se. And, and the question I want to pose is what are the physical processes that drive this decrease? And to um, answer this, I first look at the atomic gas H1. So in this plot, the gray um, error bars are measurements of the H1 at redshift above 1.5. This is coming from the quasar absorbers that I've been talking about. So using a background quasar um, to uh, look for absorption gas, gas in absorption. And at redshift below 1.5, this is coming from 21 centimeter measurements at radio wavelength. I think the H1 content of the universe is fairly well known. It's evolving by a factor of 2.5 um, from redshift 5.5 to today. And we've done this, this fit uh, shown as a, a blue line, a uh, green line here, that um, is a very simple linear fit in, in uh, linear, I mean, in, in redshift space. So the inset is showing the rate of uh, differences between the quantity in H1 atomic gas at redshift uh, five and, and it's a rate at a given redshift. And the pink is the same um, rate of change for stars, for mass in stars. And what we see is the rate at which the atomic gas, which is the original reservoir of gas is decreasing slower as a, a slower pace than the rate at which we're making stars as seen in pink. And I think part of the, the reason why there is a, a, some inconsistency here is because there is an intermediate phase that I mentioned earlier, which is this molecular phase. And only recently, um, different results from IRAM, uh, from VLA, but mostly from ALMA, have allowed us to measure the mass density of um, 
of neutral of molecular uh, gas. So let me just say again that this uh, mass density is uh, the, the amount of uh, gas um, that is normalized over the critical density at which is zero. And so here I'm showing early results of omega H2 um, that shows you know fairly large error bars. I think those measurements are still in their infancy, uh, but there is a, a indication of a decline at lower redshift. Um, and if we put off all of these results together, here is the picture that we, we, can, um, we can draw. So here, the blue line on the top is the total amount of baryons. This quantity is very well known uh, from two to three very independent uh, observa observations. One is, of course, the anisotropy in the cosmic microwave background. The other is measurements um, of uh, elements, uh, heavy elements, and, and the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And more recently, um, measurements uh, of uh, dispersion measurements in uh, fast radio bursts. All of these three um, uh, techniques have told us pretty much the same story about the total amount of baryons. As you see on this uh, log scale, most of the baryons are in the ionized gas that is not seen in these quasar absorbers. So this is dominating the mass and the volume. But the phases of the gas that is closer to star formation are this atomic and molecular gas, and they are shown here. So again, the green line is the atomic H1 gas evolution. The gray is this new molecular measurements, and the pink is for stars. So what do we see? First, at any redshift in the universe, there is more mass in atomic gas than in molecular gas. So remember, this is agnostic about which type of galaxy go into this, right? So you know, different galaxies contribute to different um, uh, measurements of H1 and H2, but this is globally looking you know, globally at those quantities, and we see that at any given redshift, there is more H1 than H2. The shape of H2 is actually mirroring this uh, star formation rate history that I was just talking about. Now, another way to look at this is this uh, cumulated view. I, I mean, I like very much this plot, but maybe it's a bit difficult to swallow. So let me walk, through, um, walk you through this uh, a little slowly. So this is now a cumulative view of the so-called condensed matter, which is, uh, you know, all the H2, H1, and star uh, components together. And here, the black line, the black dashed line is showing the amount of condensed matter at redshift six and how it would look like if it, if it weren't evolving with redshift. And what we see is that high redshift, H2 is being produced, um, H2 is being consumed as H1 is being produced and the uh, global condensed matter is, is fairly flat, but lower redshift, there is more star being made than gas being consumed. So again, you know, we need to uh, have an intake into the, the system of new gas supply to explain the amount of stars that are being formed. And so to look at this in particular and look at how the different phases of a baryon cycle through this, um, I'm looking next to the um, gas depletion time scales. So this is essentially the, um, as shown in the equation at the bottom, the mass of gas over the star formation rate. And in green, this is the cold gas uh, depletion time scale. So it's H1 plus H2. And in uh, gray, it's the molecular gas depletion time scale. This is actually fairly flat over a large look back time. So there is something universal in the way galaxy converts a molecular gas into stars. And I'd like to highlight in particular that our results are consistent with this uh, black uh, dashed line, dash dotted line, that is result of um, targeted measurements of CO in massive galaxies that pretty much you know, uh, indicate the same kind of uh, depletion time scales. So it's likely that the drop in the star formation rate history is due to the drain in the gas reservoir. And we can in turn ask the following question. So given the gas 
evolution with cosmic time and given the star mass evolution with cosmic time, how much more gas do we need to input into the system to explain the star formation rate history? And this is what's shown here in purple. This is what I call the net accretion rate. So it's the amount of gas that is both moving in galaxies, but also being transformed from the ionized phase into a, a more neutral phase, right? So this is the amount of, of material going into galaxy. This is actually quite high at high redshifts and drops at lower redshift. And in black here, I'm showing um, the uh, halo baryon accretion. And the dotted line is the same quantity scaled to a 4% efficiency. And you see that the two, the net accretion rate and, and this uh, scaled halo baryon accretion rate are, are fairly similar in, in, in shape. So these results are actually very consistent with the so-called path tube or regulator model where a slowly evolving equilibrium between inflow, outflow, and star formation is taking place in galaxy. So the picture this model is proposing is at early times, there is gas accumulation, um, star formation rate is uh, driven by the gas reservoir. And at later time, the galaxy reaches this steady state in which star formation is regulated by the net accretion rate. Now, I would like to um, look at one um, aspect of the bions, uh, the metals in particular, which uh, in astrophysics we often refer to metal as any elements heavier than helium. And, and these metals are very important because, again, they are forming two stars within galaxies. So you may be aware that um, two decades ago, there were um, a so called missing metals problem. That is, there was a identification of a, of a mismatch between the expected amount of metals that one infer from integrating the star formation rate density and the uh, sum of the different component of um, metals in uh, redshift free galaxies and other systems. And, and this discrepancy, which was large at the time, uh, was dubbed uh, the missing metals problem. So in this work, we have reviewed this, this issue but let me first start by looking at how the metals are distributed around galaxies. And for this, again, I'm going to refer to a simulation. In this case, uh, this is uh, an example of a simulation from Illustrious TNG um, 50. Uh, one galaxy that is just rotated H1, and the left uh, figure shows the metallicity map where uh, the yellow colors are more metal rich gas and the bluer colors are, are more metal poor gas. So on this plot, zero is solar metallicity, minus one is a 10 solar, minus two is a 100 solar. And what you see immediately is that the, the metallicity about this galaxy is not uniform. In fact, I'm defining the azimuthal angle as the angle between the major axis and, and the minor axis. And to the right, I'm showing the radial velocity of a gas in this same galaxy in the simulation. The green is gas that is moving in, and the red is gas that is moving out. And again, as, as the movie was showing earlier, we have a picture where the gas is preferentially, the gas that is accreting is preferentially along the plane of a major axis of a galaxy, and the gas that is moving out is along the minor axis, which is the path of least resistance. And what I find very interesting is that if we look at many of the galaxies in TNG 50, but also in Eagle, which is another high dynamical simulation, cosmological simulation, uh, we find in both those simulations a trend of metallicity shown here in the y axis and azimuthal angle shown in the x axis, right? Where the, the gas on the major axis is more metal poor and the gas on the minor axis is enriched. These are two observables, right? So potentially we can recover this trend with uh, current observations. And, and I'd like to highlight that I find this result quite remarkable because both these simulations are very different, both in the physical models that they have implemented, but also in their uh, numerical solution. And, and you know, the complex gas processes of coming in, out, maybe escaping the galaxy, maybe uh, you know, falling back into fountains, has a net results of this metallicity trend. 
Now let's move to more global quantities again and look at what's the metal content of uh, the neutral gas. So I'm showing here the result from a statistical sample of um, quasar absorbers. And again, I'm not sure you're seeing the slide. Uh, measurement of um, all of the metals in this neutral phase as a measure in quasar absorbers, um, correcting them for dust depletion, right? So some of the metals are locked into dust grains, and we here use an empirical uh, method that use multi elements to correct for this. And the um, Green data points are the individual um, measurements. The black uh, are the H1 weighted metal steam measurements. And they are evolving little, you know, about one deck over um, a 10 gigahertz lookback line. Uh, the point is that the scatter of individual measurements is larger than this evolution. And also, there is a floor below which we could detect metals but we don't right so I'm, I'm showing here in horizontal lines the current uv and optical sensitivity of these kind of observations so essentially um in this statistical sample pristine gas is is really rare now again we can um change turn these measurements into uh, measurements of the metallicity of uh, of the mass metallicity of the gas right and this is shown um, here, this is the uh, gas mass metallicity, and it's showing in green the uh, mass metallicity in uh, neutral absorbers, in uh, purple, the ones that are partly ionized, and in uh, blue, the ones that are uh, ionized. And, and the reason why we are not completely the right shift is that we focused here on very robust measurements that include both dust depletion correction and ionization correction. And we can compare this to the um, expected amount of metals in the universe that is calculated from just integrating the star formation rate density. Um, this is a compilation that is independent of the IMF because uh, mostly you know, this is produced in, in massive stars. And what we see is that most of the metal, the expected metals, are actually found in neutral gas at which is three to four. At lower redshift, a fraction of the metals are found in another, um, an other components. So that includes stars shown in pink here that are measured up to a redshift 0.7, and also hot gas in intra cluster and inter, um, intra group medium. So it's shown in yellow. And those measurements uh, today are limited to a redshift 0.7, but in the future with um, a satellite like Athena um, or Lynx. Uh, those measurements could be extended to higher redshift. So if we put these things together, here is a plot that's showing for four different redshifts, the metal budget. So starting the, from the bottom right, most of the metals are found in neutral gas at high redshift. Um, at redshift three or so, um, both neutral um, gas and ionized Partly ionized and ionized gas contribute to the metal budget. At lower shift, at redshift point one, half of the metals are found in stars, and there are more different components contributing to, to this metal budget. At intermediate redshift, redshift 1.5, we have not yet measured the amount of metals in stars or in hot gas, but I expect that when we do, we will probably find they will contribute a significant amount. So the bottom line is that today, I think we don't have evidence for a strong uh, missing metal problem. So as you know, metals and dust are very uh, related. So the next uh, question I'm going to ask is what's the cosmic evolution of the dust mass? I've mentioned earlier about this plot that we are doing a kind of um, a dust correction um, to these metal measurements. Of course, we can in turn uh, use this dust correction to measure the amount of dust in the neutral phase of a gas. And this is what's shown um, in the next uh, plot. These are measurements of uh, um, dust to metal and dust um, to gas ratio in uh, quasar absorbers 
as a function of metallicity on the x-axis for different redshift ranges shown in colors. So the top um, shows the dust to gas ratio in the Milky Way as a black cross and the um, the maximum dust to gas ratio, so that means that all of the metals are locked into dust, that would be the blue um, dotted line. The local measurements of dust to gas ratio are shown with the black dotted and dashed line, and they are pretty much in the same regime to, to our measurements. Only these quasar absorption techniques allow to uh, extend both to lower metallicity and obviously to higher redshift. And what we find is that the tight relation that is formed at high metallicity seems to um, evolve into a scatter, a larger scatter at, at the uh, lowest metallicity. So the bottom plot shows the dust to metal ratio. So it's essentially the fraction of all the metals, um, of uh, all the metal mass into the dust. And there is a decreasing um, DTM with metallicity, with decreasing metallicity. And that is essentially related to the evolution of uh, metallicity um, itself, right? So here is another um, way of looking at this. This is now um, the dust to gas ratio as a function of redshift for individual measurements in pink and for H1 weighted measurements in black. So again, the, the scatter in individual measurements is larger than, than uh, the H1 weighted measurement. So, you understand that I'm, I'm obsessed with this omega mass measurement, so we can in turn again measure the mass density of dust. So this is just, you know, the DTG that I've just um, described multiplied by the um, gas mass, uh, omega gas, that I've shown earlier in green. And that gives us the omega dust, right, that is shown here in, in red. And we can compare these measurements with uh, magnesium two measurements of um, uh, dust mass in uh, Sloan spectra using both extinction and reddening. Um, we can compare this to uh, measurements using SED fitting, uh, spectral energy distribution fit of galaxies to uh, estimate the dust mass. So there are a couple of different works, the most recent of which um, is based on the gamma survey. And of course, we can also um, look at the total amount of dust expected from the uh, cosmic far infrared background that is shown here um, as a pink area. So all of these measurements indicate an increase into the, in the mass of dust followed by a, a turnover at low redshift. And although the techniques are very different in the redshift ranges where they overlap, the agreement between the various techniques is pretty good. However, the, the new techniques that we've, uh, we've um, devised, you know, using those quasar absorbers, push measurements of uh, uh, dust mass up to the highest redshift. And I think that's interesting for uh, the new set of um, hydrodynamical uh, cosmological simulations that are incorporating, you know, on the fly dust tracking and, you know, full dust physics with production and, and destruction of dust grains as shown here uh, by the black and, and dashed line. And you see that the, the global shape of these predictions are very similar, but the, the normalization is very different. So I believe that, you know, uh, these kind of measurements can put new constraints of, uh, in these models. Now I'd like to, to zoom in a bit more closer to galaxy and, and answer the question, how, how do we, um, you know, witness those different processes of uh, bion cycling and uh, gas moving in and out observationally? Um, I think for this, we've made a, a great um, amount of progress in recent years, in part thanks to um, IFU um, spectroscopy, so integral field units or 3D spectroscopy, which is essentially instruments that provide, you know, an image where every pixel is also a spectrum. And so this kind of techniques in the optical allow to uh, probe the galaxy responsible for the absorber that um, is tracing the gas in the CGM of that object. So, you know, before uh, I fuse, I guess we were reverting to broadband imaging to find faint galaxies, but we were um, outshined by the bright background quasar. Now with the spectroscopical information, we can remove the quasar signature and we can look for faint objects next to the line of sight. And so 
Um, I would have loved to show you these little movies of uh, VLT Muse uh, data and Alma um, uh, Alma Cube. Unfortunately, I'm not on, on my PDF, so you're not going to see this moving. But essentially, both these instruments are providing um, free information on the left on the ionized gas, on the right on the molecular gas. And we can uh, play this trick, as I, as I just explained, to remove a bright quasar. Uh, this is shown by the, the little white uh, square in the scale of a plane, in the, in the plane of the sky. And we can find a number of galaxies associated with the absorbers. So in the Muse cube, there's actually multiple oxygen-free emitters. Some of them are detected in continuum, so hence the, the conic structure in the wavelength uh, direction. And in the Alma cube, that has pretty much has the same uh, field of view in bond three, we see multiple CO emitters as well, and we can reconstruct the full uh, velocity field in that case. And that's, of course, a lot of information that we can combine to uh, reconstruct what the gas is doing around those galaxies. So I'm showing here um, a reconstructed velocity field. So this is a forward modeling in 3D space to reconstruct the oxygen-free velocity field of, of rotating disks. And you see a blue component moving towards us and a red component moving away from us in that galaxy. And we've extrapolated the velocity field to the position of a quasar on the sky, right? This is the black dot here. So this is the background quasar and the line of sight that we see in absorption is piercing at that position. And thanks to the velocity field, we can measure what's the expected velocity of the gas at that um, position in the galaxy. And the bottom here is showing a normalized uh, quasar spectrum of the background object where we have put the velocity to zero for the systemic redshift of the galaxy. And it shows very nice two magnesium two components, one of which is spot on at the velocity we expect from the velocity field. The other component, however, does not. And in fact, you know, several arguments based on azimuthal angle, metallicity, but also specific angular momentum indicate that this is likely a tracer of gas accreting onto the galaxy. So nothing to do with rotation of the object, but some other component of the, of the gas kinematics. So I think this is kind of work that uh, can be done to, un to understand and, and witness accretion directly. Now the mental picture I'm drawing here is this, um, uh, you know, much like this low redshift analog, um, where you know we have a group of objects that in starlight, you know, uh, sh you know, seems to be very well separated. But when we revert to uh, H1 gas at radio wavelength, we see that there is a lot of extended low density gas um, about you know these different systems that have a high cross section on the sky. And now, uh, if we zoom in on M82, of course, this is the a school case example of uh, an object with a galactic wind. So I wanted to uh, spend a few words uh, just to, to say a bit more about ESO before, before I finish and, and take up questions. Um, I'm sure many of you know, but maybe some uh, less so, that ESO is a, uh, is a large um, European-led um, effort to uh, have telescopes in the southern hemisphere. Um, ESO today is about 700 peoples, um, people, so uh, including engineers and scientists and uh, administration staff. Um, we have multiple sites uh, across the world. Uh, so I'm based in Germany uh, near Munich, uh, and we have multiple sites in uh, Chile uh, for our observatories. So there's an there's a office in Santiago, uh, there's La Silla Observatory. There is Paranal where the VLTs um, sit. Uh, Amazonas will um, host the, um, the ELT, and Ashatnagar is the host of the ALMA um, instrument. I wanted also to show you a very nice video of the ELT, which is part of my everyday. Uh, life work, but unfortunately that would not happen. So let me just, before I, I finish, advertise some of our opportunities uh, to come and join uh, ESO. Um, we have a multiple um, uh, programs for students or, or visitors uh, to come for a different um, time. 
uh, length, we have a very attractive ESO studentship program for people that are enrolled uh, into PhD programs across the world to come to ESO uh, to join for one or two years and uh, maybe work on a focused uh, part of a project or, or a, a type of data. We have a full-fledged uh, PhD program together with our near institute here in Kashing, um, namely the Max Planck for, um, for astrophysics and Max Planck for um, extraterrestrial physics, MPA, MPE, and the University of Munich. This is called the IMPRESS program. It's a very prestigious uh, program. And some of the students are uh, hosted here at ESO. And of course, we have a fellowship program, both in Chile and, and in Kashing in Germany. Uh, where people can stay three to four years and contribute to the observatory tasks, but also uh, mostly under, you know, undertake their own uh, science projects. And we have, um, I must say, you know, a student from, um, a PhD student from uh, South Africa recently, um, that some of you may know, Stabile Koba, who I think did a great job uh, working with us here. So just to finish, let me, um, First, apologize for all the technical difficulties, but also leave you with some uh, science take home messages. I think we have indications that the star formation rate history uh, decrease is driven by the lack of molecular gas. This is actually related to a decrease in the net accretion rate, which is itself uh, somewhat related to the growth of dark matter halos. I think today's census show very little evidence for the so-called missing metals problem that was identified a few years ago, but, but we need to measure uh, those metals major redshifts. So I think that's an interesting task for, for us in the coming years. And I think we have made a new calculation of the dust mass um, up to the highest redshift. Uh, and this is you know, potentially going to help us uh, constrain new, sim new kind of simulations of, of dust production and destruction. And with this, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand, uh, either raise your hand in the chat or, or please put the question uh, in text format in the chat and I will convey it uh, to the speaker. While we uh, wait for the audience to uh, put in their questions, I had a question of my own. Um, do you know if uh, either low energy, that is radio, and or uh, high energy, up to gamma rays, observations can play any role in tracing um, epochs of star formation activity? And would they help at all in uh, these studies? Yes, you're right. I, I should have mentioned this. So of course, we, we're very uh, excited about SKA and, and its pathfinders uh, to measure um, the H1, uh, first of all. So ASCAP, uh, as you may know, is undertaking this flash survey that is looking at H1 in absorption uh, in individual objects uh, up to the highest redshift. And I think this is important because as I've indicated, um, you know, this measurement of omega H1 is uh, relying on very different techniques depending on redshift. And I think it would be interesting and important to um, be able to make those measurements, um, you know, by two techniques at the same uh, redshift epoch. So, um, Currently, the divide is around redshift one, but I believe you know ASCAP and, and ultimately SKA will, will allow us to, to push these measurements uh, perhaps even beyond one uh, using stacking techniques as well. Um, Meerkat itself is um, also pursuing very exciting projects, including the MOL survey that is looking at uh, atomic OH and molecular gas um, in a blind manner. And I think that's uh, very exciting as well, right? To use this to uh, look at the molecular gas uh, at the lowest redshift in absorption. So yes, I think there's a lot to hope from these different experiments. Thank you so much. Uh, so there is a question from Sri Ram, uh, which I'm going to feel first. 
Uh, how is the metallicity versus redshift trend reconciled with the inefficient metal mixing that we find in the CGM, especially at low redshifts? Right. So this is very interesting. So I, I guess um, we are referring here to um, recent results of what we call zoom in simulation, where we, um, you know, move from you know, a full cosmological context and refine the simulation in the CGM region um, where the density is higher and uh, reach scales that are the order of hundred of parsec or so. And um, one effort in particular that I find very interesting is led by uh, Moni Peoples at, at the Space Telescope. And um, she has this a suite of ENSO simulation that she called Foggy and she, uh, demonstrated how um, the way we measure a metal scene absorption along the line of sight, um, especially when not so much for the neutral metal city, but for the most ionized metal city, there may be a special mismatch between the H1 and the ionization, the ionized gas, right? And so this is, you know, uh, probably uh, an indication that the, the way we integrate along the line of sight, the so-called column density, may not allow us to, um, to show this in details. So I guess, um, you know, this, this poor uh, metal mixing may be below what we uh, currently are able to see. And if we only stick to along the line of sight, we will not resolve this because you need infinite spectral resolution to, to do this. But what's very new, exciting, I think, is um, not using you know point like background quasar, but extended background sources to look at the model distribution along the transverse direction, right? So not along the line of sight anymore, but in the plane of the sky. And in particular, this has been a very exciting work led by uh, Sebastian Lopez and others using the MUSE uh, instruments and observing lens, giant arcs, lens arc, and looking at how the magnesium 2, for example, distribution evolve spatially on, on small scales, right? And there will be many more of this because in a ELT area, we will not use quasar anymore as background source, but galaxy, because today they are too faint, but, but tomorrow with an ELT, we'll be able to look at this uh, very easily. And so again, this, um, you know, unresolved background sources will inform us about the metal mixing. So to answer the question is, I don't know if we have today, um, you know, an inconsistency between the metallicity uh, evolution with redshift and the poor metal mixing, but I do believe that we have not yet observationally probed this uh, expected um, poor metal mixing. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question in the list is, has galactic chemical evolution ever been modeled with delay differential equations? Yes. Um, so that's a very good question as well. So yes, a few years back, um, uh, I don't know what reference would be good here, um, but maybe some Ferreira rock or, or Bergeron. Um, there's been, you know, people attempting, and of course, there's the other the, the, the Boisset uh, work, so the, and uh, Ponzos. So, uh, you know, people were trying to essentially model uh, galaxies as closed block uh, systems and, and, you know, understanding the metal production um, in, in terms of differential equation. And, and I think to first order, this, this kind of way, uh, analytical way is, is working pretty well. Of course, we move to uh, you know a new generation with this um, hydrodynamical simulations that you know have uh, you know are producing uh, metals in galaxies with a different yield and so forth. But you know we have multiple elements. We can look at abundance ratio. We can look at a different um, gas temperature tracers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think this is a very beautiful kind of work. Thank you. Um, the final question is uh, from Paul Fallon. Uh, the question is, is it possible to measure the densities of the heavier metal elements as a function of redshift? Right. So, um, so 
which elements in particular are we, are we thinking of, of um, deuterium or something like this? I'm, I'm, I don't know if Paul could answer on the chat. So. Uh, Paul, could you please uh, uh, let us know which elements uh, did you have in mind? Right, but I mean, this is where the direction we were uh, going. Uh, so, so the right on that is yeah. Uh, yeah. So heavier elements not created via star formation processes. Yes, but that's, those are, I mean, so those are very rare, right? So we, we find, you know, um, elements that are being made in, in early times in Big Bang, uh, lithium and, and deuterium and so forth. But those um, are extremely rare. Uh, so we find them, um, you know, in just a few very carefully selected uh, quasar absorbers, and and you know, making the mass density requires a statistical sample, right? So essentially, you look at how many objects contain a given element over how many do not, or how many, you know, um, along the line of sight, how many redshift step do not contain this element. Be interested to see more. So, what, what, you know, what do we, what would that be interesting uh, to have the heavier element mass density? But maybe this is a conversation for <laughs> we can uh, have uh, offline. Sure. There is one uh, final question before we uh, end this talk. Uh, so the question is, is there any possibility that the metallicity difference in major and minor axis is mainly due to projection effect? Right, so I, uh, maybe I have, um, I have not been pretty clear here. So this galaxy, obviously, we've simulated in 3D, right? And so uh, what the plot I was showing, maybe I should go back to it. The plot I'm showing is looking at very specifically um, Oh God, so I would have to go about here. Um, it's very specifically looking at uh, the metallicity actually in a shell, so in 3D space, right? Um, so of course the plot I was showing, this uh, one example from, from one galaxy is projected, right? But this calculation here of the metallicity, it's um, on a shell. So we take, you know, hundreds of galaxies with stellar mass 10 to the uh, 9.5. And we picked a shell at 100 kiloparsec, and we've measured the metallicity um, of that of a gas at that in that sphere, if you want, right? So, so what we find that outflows, of course, are 3D, and they have an op opening angle, and this opening angle is enriched with metals, and the major axis, you know, plane um, is less so. So I think this is this is not a projection effect because this is calculated in 3D space. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, please join me in a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk.